Keegan Chandler is a historian of religion specializing in the areas of monotheism, Christology, Greco-Roman religions, and Japanese religions. He is currently pursuing his PhD in religious studies at the University of Cape Town, and he holds a Master of Theology from Campbellsville University and a Bachelor's from Skad University. Chandler is the author of Constantine and the Divine Mind, The Imperial Quest for Primitive Monotheism, The God of Jesus in Light of Christian Dogma, and The Historical Introduction to Thomas Emlyn's and, his, and Humble Inquiry. His articles on monotheism, historical Christology, and religious syncretism have appeared in a variety of academic journals. Chandler serves as an adjunct professor at Atlanta Bible College and also as vice chair on the board of directors for the Unitarian Christian Alliance. He currently lives in Texas with his wife and three, soon to be four, children. Keegan Chandler. Jesus' messianic self-awareness and early high Christology. In other words, we're going to be investigating the historical question, did Jesus think he was God? And the answers of several popular scholars to this vital inquiry. You should all have a copy of the paper in your folder, and I encourage you to follow along if you wish. There is quite a bit of uh, ground to cover here this morning, so without further ado, we will go ahead and get started. Historians of early Christianity approach the question, did Jesus think he was God, under immense pressure. On the one hand, they're squeezed by what A.E. Harvey once described as the constraints of history, and on the other, by the daunting bulk of ecclesiastical tradition. Not a few scholars have dared to pass the narrow space between these rocks, though they have arrived at dramatically different locales. Some have found themselves to be standing squarely on what Orthodox tradition has long said about Jesus, that he understood himself to be, in some sense, the God of Israel. Others, belonging also to a long tradition, have concluded that the Jesus of history, the Jewish man of history, could not possibly have conceived himself as the God of Christian dogma. But how is this startling dichotomy possible? How should people now think about what Jesus thought about himself? Our central inquiry about Jesus' self-understanding cannot be detached from the debate over the reconstruction of Christological development, an evolutionary framework in which Jesus was transitioned from an exalted human being to a pre-existent and incarnate deity has long been the standard assumption. However, another informal band of scholars has now emerged which finds the birth of a high Christology much earlier, even in the earliest days of the Jesus movement. This so-called early high Christology club here after the EHCC, has included scholars like Larry Hurtado, Richard Bauckham, N.T. Wright, Simon Gathercole, and Michael Bird. The general claims of the EHCC are made first by fixating on something distinctive about the God of the Bible, for example, some action or title, and then emphasizing places in the New Testament where the same or something similar is ascribed to Jesus. Next, it is asserted that mere creatures could never have had such things predicated of them in this first century Jewish context. Thus, Jesus, in the eyes of the New Testament writers, must have been not merely human, but divine, whatever that means. And in this way, voices within the EHCC have generally insisted that any human or angelic Christology is insufficient for explaining the biblical data. They have also, and to varying degrees, demonstrated a tendency to downplay the fact of Christological development in Catholic history. They will admit development, but usually only a certain kind of development, nothing radical or wild, but only clarifying development. Next. They will assert that the presence of this high Christology in the New Testament equates to the presence, or at least to the embryonic presence, of Orthodox Christology in the earliest days of the church. As Richard Bauckham has insisted, quote, the highest possible Christology, the inclusion of Jesus in the unique divine identity, was central to the faith of the early church, even before any of the New Testament writings were written, since it occurs in all of them. Demonstrated here is also the EHCC a tendency to avoid describing the earliest Christology in terms of Catholic theological formulae. Appeals to divine identity tend to replace more palpably anachronistic categories like divine nature or substance. And it should be said here that this new and favored term divine identity is somehow even less clear than substance, 
a truly remarkable accomplishment. <laughs> Ultimately, an awareness, uh, an awareness of the gulf between the content of the New Testament and later conciliar statements is demonstrated alongside an earnest desire to justify both the early provenance of those statements, basic claims, and their biblical nature. Now, what about EHCC answers to the question, did Jesus think he was God? Unsurprisingly, club members tend to conclude that Jesus' self-awareness in the Gospels approximates to the dominant Trinitarian Christology reflected in the Catholic creeds of the late 4th and 5th centuries. However, they are not always agreed on the nature or the extent of this compatibility. As we will discover, their admirable concern to remain faithful to the historical context of the Gospels, a context which always depresses the urge to say that certain passages present Jesus as having the divine nature or as the second member of the Trinity, often maroon their Christological proposals in hopeless ambiguity. I suggest that the ambiguity and heterogeneity within the EHCC regarding this basic historical question, did Jesus think he was God, provides a unique opportunity for assessing the school's interpretive value. In this presentation, the answers of several EHCC scholars uh, to this question of Jesus' self-understanding will be considered and ultimately compared to the rival and heretofore standard Unitarian proposition that the earliest recoverable view of Jesus' self-awareness as exhibited in the gospel documents is reflective of a human Christology. In other words, that Jesus thought that he was the human agent of God. And we'll start with Michael Bird. Responding to Bart Ehrman in 2014, members of the EHCC composed how God became Jesus, the real origins of belief in Jesus' divine nature. Here, Bird devotes an entire chapter to the question, did Jesus think he was God? And he suggests that Jesus identified himself as a divine agent with a unique authority and a unique relationship to Israel's God. He believed himself to be embodying the very person of God in his mission to renew and restore Israel. While the early church may have said more than that, they certainly never said less. Bird also says that there is no reason to see Jesus as anything other than a good monotheist. He affirmed the Jewish confession of God's oneness, the Shema, and he called for steadfast devotion to God. Bird then moves to distance his proposition from a certain popular, but in his view, faulty reading of the historical data. I think it is necessary to explode a popular caricature where Jesus cruises around Galilee announcing, hi, I'm God, I'm going to die on the cross for your sins soon, but first of all, I'm going to teach you how to be a good Christian and how to get to heaven. And after that, I thought it would be fitting if you all worshiped me as a second member of the Trinity. This might seem a rather silly way to understand Jesus' identity, but it is a sketch of Jesus that many Bible-believing Christians have. When I contend that Jesus understood himself to be divine, this is definitely not what I am talking about. When I say that Jesus knew himself to be God, I mean that he was conscious that in him, the God of Israel was finally returning to Zion to renew the covenant and to fulfill the promises God had made to the nation about a new exodus. But what does this mean that Jesus knew God was in him? First, it must be pointed out that all Christians, regardless of Christological preference, would agree that Jesus is both unique in his authority and in his relationship with the God of Israel, that Jesus was a good monotheist who taught others to worship the one God, and that he was, at least in some sense, embodying this God and his mission to save Israel. Bird's talk of God being in Christ even implies, at least on the face of it, that there are two beings in view. One is, in some sense, present in or working through the other. And on the basis of 2 Corinthians 5.19 alone, all Christians would agree that God was in Christ reconciling the world and that Jesus in his ministry was accomplishing God's work. Indeed, the real disagreement is not over whether or not God was in him, but over the metaphysical import of those words. Was God in Jesus in a representational or agential sense? This is what Unitarian Christians believe. Was God in Christ as a second entity occupying the same body as the human named Jesus? This is what some historical Gnosticizing Christians propose. Was God in Christ in the sense that Christ can be understood as God himself? This resembles modalistic schemes. 
Or was God in Christ in the sense that only one personal, one person of a tri-personal entity called God became incarnate while the other two remained in heaven? This would be what the interpretation of Trinitarian Christians. When Byrd argues that Jesus knew himself to be God or divine in the sense that he knew God was in him, which of these conceptions does he propose that Jesus had in mind? If Jesus was not, in his view, claiming to be the second person of the Trinity, then what does he mean when he says that he believed that that when, when he says that Jesus, quote, believed himself to be embodying the very person of God in his mission to save Israel? It remains to be seen. In the rest of Byrd's chapter, he plums the depths of the Old Testament where he finds passages which reflect God's promise to save and guide his people, to send his Messiah, to perform his work. Byrd then suggests that in Jesus' ministry, we see that, quote, the lines between divine author and divine agent were becoming blurred, end quote. He points to Jesus' critics who asked the famous question, who can forgive sins but God alone? And he suggests that Jesus' claim to be able to do this looked absolutely blasphemous to those steeped in Jewish monotheism. Of course, Byrd ignores the crowd of historical Jewish monotheists who attended that scene in Matthew's version and who evidently had the opposite reaction to Jesus' claim to be the Son of Man, the human being who has the authority to forgive sins. Here the writer of Matthew comments, But when the crowd saw this, they were awestruck and glorified God who had given such authority to men. In other words, the Jewish monotheists who observed Jesus' claims understood that he thought of himself as a uniquely qualified human being to whom God had delegated certain prerogatives. Quite clearly, Jesus' sympathetic audience interpreted his self-understanding in terms of human agency. Bird's position that Jesus must have thought he was personally God on the basis that he does what God does seems to entirely miss this concept. Certainly, Bird thought Uh, Certainly, Bird sees that Jesus thought he was God's agent, but in some sense, he also thought that he was God. So far, Bird has not thought to resolve the problem of how anyone can understand themselves to be their own agent with recourse to Trinitarian metaphysics. Indeed, Bird claims he is definitely not saying that the historical Jesus thought of himself in terms of Trinity. But, If Jesus thought of himself as simultaneously God and as God's agent, and not in a Trinitarian way, but definitely in a way that a Unitarian view would be excluded, then we have yet to discover precisely what birds Jesus thought about himself. However, we may learn more about Bird's view by consulting Bird's other writings. Elsewhere, we read that Bird believes the doctrine of the Trinity espoused by later Catholic councils, and therefore Trinitarian Christology, is a view of the New Testament which resulted from the church's exegesis of Scripture and its philosophical reflections on the language of Scripture. The New Testament thus implies Trinitarian theology and is, in fact, the only doctrinal framework which can make sense of the biblical data. He says, while classic Trinitarian statements in some sense go beyond the New Testament— Without the Trinity, we have a hard time making sense of what the New Testament says about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He insists that later Trinitarian creeds are not, in fact, wildly or radically innovative, but they draw on themes that are embedded in the New Testament. So in this light, is it possible to read Bird's book chapter on what the Jesus of the Gospels thought about himself with a glimmer of clarity as to Bird's real view? Indeed, Jesus believed he says, that in his person, Yahweh was finally returning to Zion. Is this a Trinitarian claim? We know that Bird does not mean this in a modalistic sense. He does not mean that God the Father became incarnate as the man Jesus, since he elsewhere labels modalism a later heresy. And if the gospel data about Jesus is not indicative of either a modalistic Christology or a Unitarian Christology, and if it positively is indicative of Trinitarianism and even only understood in light of Trinitarianism, can we not at last deduce that Bird's Jesus did think of himself as God in a Trinitarian sense despite Bird's assurances? Indeed, should we not pay attention to Bird's use of somewhat Trinitarian-sounding language, perhaps evocative of the later Catholic creeds, that Jesus thought he was God in his person? But how are we to reconcile this with his strong statements that he is definitely not imagining a Jesus claiming to be the second member of the Trinity? In the end, if Bird does not believe, as he says in his chapter, that the man from Nazareth said that he was God in the way that Trinitarian Christology says he is God, if that deduction remains a silly caricature, then we are still at a loss regarding Bird's real position. 
It's incumbent upon Bird to tell us precisely what, he me what it means when he says that Jesus understood himself to be God in his person. But at this stage, we will allow Bird a final chance to clarify his proposal by considering an analogy offered at the end of his book chapter. Bird winds down his chapter by affirming that Israel's long-awaited return of her king was not the return of Aragorn to Gondor. Apologies to Lord of the Rings fans. But God in Jesus of Nazareth coming to his people in a day of visitation. Again, we return to the murky claim of God being in Jesus. And again, we do not know what it means. Working with Bird's analogy in the Lord of the Rings, the coming of Aragorn to his kingdom involved the arrival of a single human person. Is Jesus not a single human person? The coming of Bird's Jesus is apparently different, and it seems to involve the coming of two entities, one human and the other not human. Or does it? If there is only one someone in view, then this is a modalistic or docetic Jesus. And if there are two someones in view, is one someone representing the other, or is one someone occupying the same human body as the other? The important questions for Christology are not answered in this analogy. If Bird's reading is not modalist, docetist, or Unitarian, but Trinitarian, it's difficult not to think that Bird's Jesus came, spoke, and acted, and thought of himself in a Trinitarian sense, though this is what he describes as a silly picture and one he does definitely does not have in view. Ultimately, and in the most charitable reading of his chapter, when the historical Jesus thought of himself as God or divine, he did so in some vague and indiscriminate sense and did not sufficiently explain his relationship to the God of Israel. Thus, neither does Bird. And in this light, the way that we are to think of Jesus' self-conception remains as difficult to imagine as the value of Bird's proposition. Indeed, until an intelligible theory is proposed, we cannot compare Bird's offering to any rival theories. We cannot test its value. Merely reasserting the old prejudice against mere man Christologies serves absolutely no theoretical function and seems hardly worthy of our precious time. But what if Bird's escape route is to assert that the gospel writers themselves were unclear on the nature of Christ and his relationship to the God of Israel? Bird does say, after all, that, quote, the lines between divine author and divine agent were becoming blurred. But this is only to be uncharitable to the gospel's authors, to assign to them significant confusion about something that was allegedly very important to them and so should be important to us. Indeed, to claim that Jesus thought he was in some sense divine and that he imagined himself to be blurring together with his God and Father is also to assign confusion to Jesus. The entire suggestion is uncharitable to, to historical persons and implausible for this reason alone. It seems more likely that the historian at hand, Bird in this case, has not considered the possibility that he himself is confused and that the lines look blurred between author and agent because he is coming to the text loaded with presuppositions and prejudice. Concluding this review of Bird, I cannot help but return to his earlier statements about Christological innovation. While Jesus claimed to be God's human agent, Bird says, the early Trinitarian church said more than that. And in truth, the classic Trinitarian statements in some sense go beyond the New Testament. Bird insists that these later creeds were not wildly or radically innovative, but they were innovative nonetheless. Indeed, what more did later Trinitarian Christians say about Jesus' relationship to God that Jesus did not say about himself. Since non-Trinitarian Christians can agree with both Bird's positive Christological claims about God being in Jesus, and with everything the Gospels tell us about Jesus' self-reflection, Jesus must not have said anything about being God in an exclusively Trinitarian sense. If we ultimately find that the facts first received by Jesus' historical audience contained no uniquely Trinitarian claims, then we are left with the following conclusions. First, from a historical standpoint, since exclusively Trinitarian claims are not present on the lips of Jesus or the gospel writers, they are confirmed to be innovations by later Christians. Second, from a theological standpoint, to think of Christ in the sense that Bird does, as the second member of the Trinity, was not incumbent upon Jesus' original audience and should not now be considered required belief for those who would agree with his self-reflection today. Third, if the historical Jesus was, in fact, a Trinitarian theologian, and in truth, the second member of the Trinity, he will be found to have ultimately misled his historical audience and us 
by either allowing pre-existing Jewish expectations about the Messiah's humanity to wrongly frame the interpretation of his speech, or by allowing a deadly ignorance to flourish on these Trinitarian propositions which are so often alleged to be of eternal significance. We would all have to seriously reconsider both the morality and the skill of such a teacher. What begins as a praiseworthy effort to avoid anachronistic interpretive categories ultimately does worse than consign the gospel's Christology to ambiguity. Perhaps by design, the composition of EHCC arguments often have the effect of leading the witness in an orthodox direction. While Byrd, ever on the alert for anachronism, is unwilling as a historian to say that the Jesus of the Gospels is portrayed as the second person of the Trinity, such a conclusion is precisely what he hopes his readers will draw. The interpretive outline, which Byrd lambasts as a silly sketch in the minds of many Bible-believing Christians, is ultimately one which he thinks the New Testament can't properly be read without. N.T. Wright, arguably the most popular New Testament scholar identified with the EHCC, has likewise tried his hand at the challenge of Jesus' identity. Wright suggests that understanding Jesus' vocation, his strong feelings about his suitability for his career, is the key to unlocking the riddle of his self-awareness. He says that investigating Jesus' self-understanding is a process neither of psychoanalysis nor of romantic fiction, but of history. History seeks, among other things, to answer the question, why did this character act in this way? And among the characteristic answers such questions receive is, he believed at the core of his being that it was his duty, his destiny, his vocation to do so. The study of, person, of people's beliefs about their own vocation has not been made sufficiently explicit. So Wright understands that the reason why people do things is often because they feel it is either their right or their obligation to do them. And this fact can be informative for learning what people really think about themselves. And Wright is not wrong here, of course, but his observation seems trivial. As we've seen, it is not enough to simply identify Jesus' vocation, that is, his feelings about his suitability to perform God's work, since several competing Christologies can affirm that Jesus understood his duty to include acting on God's behalf in the world. But what does Wright think considering Jesus' vocation will tell us? Like Bird, who ostensibly borrows much from Wright, he sees a Jesus conscious of the idea that the God of Israel was in him. Again, we have yet to learn what this means. Even more mystifying is Wright's regular insistence that the God of Israel came in and as Jesus. This oft-repeated statement encapsulates the typical vacuousness of both his and other EHCC offerings. In one sentence, we are told that Jesus is at the same time someone other than God and is also the same someone as God. God is at once in him, but also is him. Such conundrums are not alleviated by detour to anachronistic metaphysics, and rightly so. But it is interesting that despite allegedly finding in the mouth of the historical Jesus claims to be divine, Wright continues to make this important distinction, quote, Jesus thought of himself in a way which stands in continuity, though not identity, with what Paul and the other New Testament writers said about him. Knowing that Wright believes Paul and the New Testament writers thought Jesus was pre-existent and incarnate God, one wonders about the proposed discrepancy between their writings and the available evidence. What was Jesus lacking in his own testimony about himself that his followers allegedly stated explicitly? On certain facts, it seems... Jesus and the New Testament writers overlapped. The fact that Jesus was the Messiah, for example, is easily discerned in both. Wright has no doubt that the historical Jesus understood himself in this way and that he was perceived to be and even executed as a messianic claimant. But as Wright points out, while Jesus and other Jews clearly believed that he was Israel's Messiah, quote, this tells us nothing about whether he believed himself to be in any sense identified with Israel's God, end quote. This significant information about his deity is evidently a matter on which, Jesus on which Wright presumes that the historical Jesus is either silent or is surprisingly unclear. And getting clear on this purportedly vital issue was a job which Jesus apparently delegated to later theologians. Ultimately, Wright's portrait of a divine Jesus is directly informed by the historical actions of Jesus, which he understands were the actions of Israel's God. He concludes that, quote, 
The overwhelming historical impression from the gospels as a whole is of a human being doing what Israel's God said he would do, of a human being embodying, incarnating what Israel's God had said that he would do across page after page in Israel's scriptures, end quote. Here we must pause and point out that what Ryan has described as Jesus' self-awareness of his role as Messiah, as well as his claim to divine authority and to unique relationship with God, are all acknowledged by Unitarian Christians and scholars who find nothing of the deity of Christ in the Gospels. So far, then, we are still looking for that unique proposition about divinity which Jesus allegedly imagined for himself and with, and with which only subscribers to early high Christology and not Unitarian Christians can abide. In his book, Jesus and the Victory of God, Wright addresses more directly the question about whether Jesus knew he was God. Here he recognizes the inherent weakness of pursuing the question of vocation too narrowly. Quote, awareness of vocation, he says, is by no means the same thing as Jesus having the sort of supernatural awareness of himself, of Israel's God and the relation between the two of them, such as often envisaged by those who are concerned to maintain a high Christology. End quote. Indeed, it is not so easy, as Wright acknowledges, to simply say that Jesus is the God of Israel, as even some EHC scholars so boldly do. Nevertheless, Wright attempts to salvage high Christology while at the same time grappling with what is at best a dearth of historical data. In the gospel, in light of the gospel portraits, Wright is forced to conclude that the historical Jesus, quote, did not know that he was God, at least not in the same way that one knows one is male or female, hungry or thirsty, or that one ate an orange an hour ago. His knowledge was of a more risky, but perhaps more significant sort, like knowing one is loved. To recognize one's own sex, to know whether one is hungry, and to know whether one has eaten or not is to have access to the most basic facts about the self. The confidence that we all have in such basic facts was evidently lacking in Christ. And Wright's suggestion that Jesus knew himself to be God in a risky way, like knowing one is loved, reveals how deficient this person's self-knowledge actually was. Indeed, knowing one is loved is more a matter of faith than knowledge. One cannot have perfect knowledge about another's opinions of them. Rather, they can only draw conclusions on the basis of observable actions. Indeed, Wright continues, quote, one cannot prove that one is loved except by living it, end quote. For right, Jesus then believed that he was God in some sense, but had no true knowledge of it and had less confidence in that reality than in what he ate for dinner. In truth, Wright would rather leave behind metaphysical speculations entirely. He suggests we forget the pseudo-Orthodox attempts to make Jesus of Nazareth conscious of being the second person of the Trinity, and would rather we all focus instead on a young Jewish prophet telling a story about Yahweh returning to Zion as judge and redeemer and then embodying it while riding into the city in tears. While Wright prefers high drama, others still remain interested in high Christology and in Wright's conception of it and how he thinks that conception squares with both the biblical evidence and the demands of orthodoxy. For the sake of charity, we will assume that both Byrd and Wright are, as they claim to be, theologically in line with the Orthodox tradition. And we will assume that they are both referring to the human nature of the dual nature Jesus when they, spoke, when they speak of his self-awareness. Indeed, it must be the humanity of Christ, which Wright has in view, as he suggests that Jesus even agonized over his own self-understanding and wrestled with the question through prayer and doubt. An Orthodox theologian, or a pseudo-Orthodox one, according to Wright, whatever that means, would identify this as the struggle of the human mind in Christ. But if, it is the case, if this is the case, theologically speaking, wouldn't this agonizing and very human doubt in his messiahship be immediately quashed by his divinity so that he had no struggle at all? Would not the omniscience carried by his divine nature so forcefully flood his humanity that he would suddenly have, without any reservation, the very knowledge which Wright says he absolutely did not have? Wright has very good reasons to avoid such lines of theological inquiry. Perhaps even more challenging than the proposition that Jesus had two minds, divine and human, is the proposition that the one divine person, Jesus, had a divine mind but somehow didn't know it was there. <laughs> 
and even less appealing for the historian is any interpretation of a historical figure's sayings and actions which paces beyond the evidence for both of those things in favor of the hallowed speculation of later enthusiasts. Despite Wright's attempt to bypass Catholic tradition and to work directly within the constraints of history, his other pledge to the constraints of orthodoxy ultimately casts him headlong into a problem of meaning. Indeed, both he and Bird have disparaged the proposition that Jesus walked around thinking and speaking as if he were the second person of the Trinity. But in the works under review, neither have articulated in a satisfying way precisely who and what this Jesus, if not the human agent imagined by Unitarian Christians, actually understood himself to be. The late Larry Hurtado, famous for his lifetime of research into early Christian worship practices, once described himself as a charter member of the EHCC. Hurtado's reason for existence was to dismantle the claims of the history of religion school, primarily those of Wilhelm Busset and his Kyrios Christos, which saw any high Christology, which treats Jesus as divine and worships him, as representative of a later and acutely Hellenistic development not present in the earliest Jesus movement. Hurtado, armed with Hengel, is widely understood to have successfully countered Busset in several areas, and his work has understandably been employed by evangelical voices eager to bolster their partisan disputes about the deity of Christ. Hurtado, however, diverges in some important and even surprising ways from others in the EACC. While Wright emphasized Jesus' own sense of purpose, essentially for Hurtado, identifying Jesus as a divine being is more a matter of focusing on what Jesus' followers said about him rather than on anything he said or did himself. Very clearly in Hurtado's eyes, the early Christians treated Jesus in a way that they might normally reserve for God. This plays out in what he describes as a binatarian pattern of devotion in Paul's writings and elsewhere in the New Testament, which represents an apparently novel mutation in or variant form of Jewish monotheistic practice. This was ostensibly an evolution informed by powerful post-Easter revelatory experiences. But what about the historical Jesus? Hurtado emphasizes how informative the reverential acts paid to Jesus are for the question of how Jesus came to be viewed as a divine person. Of course, what actions are done toward a person are not always sufficient for explaining who that person is believed by their audience to be. In the United States, citizens rise for the entrance of both local judges and the nation's president. Focusing on how historical figures were treated by others around them may be helpful for questions of self-understanding, but it can also be misleading. Hurtado concedes that all of the language which the Gospels used to describe the homage paid to Jesus, quote, fit within the vocabulary of homage in respect of the time, and they describe actual gestures widely used in various traditional cultures to express homage, respect, and reverence toward a figure deemed one superior, whether human or divine, and or any figure from whom one seeks an important favor or benefit in a circumstance of great need. Nevertheless, Hurtado believes that we can still detect in Matthew a, quote, clear programmatic effort to heighten the homage given by people to the earthly Jesus, end quote. But these efforts by the writer of Matthew, which Hurtado boldly suggests were not simple historical distortion, were intended to enhance his own audience's reverence of Jesus to some degree beyond what the historical Jesus audience may have offered him. However, Hurtado concludes that, quote, we should not mistake these scenes as evidence of direct continuity between the homage that people gave to the historical Jesus and the worship of post-Easter Christian circles. The latter represents a notable development beyond the time of Jesus' ministry, and this development can be accounted for historically only by invoking additional factors, including powerful experiences of new revelation that helped to generate this remarkable binatarian pattern of devotion. Thus, the way that Jesus' historical audience treated him differed significantly from the way that he was reverenced by post-Easter circles. And since it was the post-Easter circles which held him to be a divine person worthy of cultic worship, recourse to the reverence of Jesus during his historical ministry and the quest for self-understanding seems useless for the EHCC cause. Hurtado may believe that the worship of Jesus stems from his earliest Jewish followers and not from later Hellenizers, but what did this worship indicate? Most Unitarian Christians seem to have no problem with the proposition that Jesus was worshiped, and they worship him themselves. Again, the language of divinity is not helpful, and the basic questions of Christology are left completely unanswered by it. 
Hurtado's insistence that early Christians felt it appropriate and necessary to worship Jesus means nothing for Jesus' is God controversies and is likewise irrelevant to our central question about his self-understanding. Hurtado has understood all of this perfectly, of course. Despite the popularity of his claims among contemporary apologists about Christ worship emerging in the earliest Christian circles, less known is what Hurtado actually thought about Jesus' self-awareness. When asked in a 2016 interview about whether or not Jesus thought he was God, Hurtado emphatically replied that, quote, Jesus did not claim that he was God and did not imagine himself to be a second person of the Trinity and did not insist that he should be worshipped, end quote. Enthusiastic Orthodox apologists are certain to be disappointed by this frank answer, which only reinforces the view of their Unitarian Christian rivals. Despite Hurtado's concession, however, it is interesting that he frequently appeared to rush to the rescue of Jesus' God theology only moments after undermining it. In the same interview in which he said that Jesus did not think he was God, he cast also the following escape rope. It would have been ludicrous for Jesus to claim to be God before his exaltation. We suppose this means that after God exalted him, it is possible that Jesus could have said something like that. According to the sources we have, therefore, Jesus did not think he was God, though he might have revealed something of that sort, which we simply have no record of. Thus, the chessboard is transitioned from the confines of the historical data to the realm of speculation. And here we might also point out that the post-resurrection Jesus could have also told his audience that he was certainly not the one God in any sense imagined by the early high Christology club, proving such speculations entirely unhelpful. In hindsight, it appears that Hurtado, for some unknown reason, adroitly peppered his analysis with enough breadcrumbs about Jesus' worship and his transcendent status and his divine-like status uh, to the ends that many apologists have and will likely continue to discover an open door to the deity of Christ in his works. Now, with the opinions of Byrd, Wright, and Hurtado in view, we will at once recognize areas of overlap and conflict regarding Jesus' self-awareness. We'll start with Bird. For Bird, Jesus thought that he was God's human agent. He also definitely knew that he was God, though in some undefined sense, but not in an explicitly Trinitarian, modalist, or Unitarian sense. As for Wright, Jesus thought he was God's human agent. He came to believe, after some period of doubt, that he was also God in some undefined sense, but he didn't know for certain. As for Hurtado, Jesus thought he was God's human agent. He certainly did not imagine that he was God, but if he did, he never would have said so before his exaltation, and he might have said something like that afterward, which we have no record of. The one item on which all three of these scholars obviously agree is the fact that the historical Jesus thought that he was God's human agent. They all find easy agreement on this point because it is the one clearly dictated by the historical evidence. And this item happens to be precisely what Unitarian Christians also affirm and all that they are willing to affirm and for the very same reason. Where each of these EHCC scholars diverge is in their speculation about how this human agent might be more than a human agent. In other words, in their various movements beyond what the historical evidence demands. Indeed, the reason they cannot collectively nail down the sense in which Jesus understood his ontological connection to the God of Israel is because the historical Jesus never imagines one. Members of the EHCC are, in the end, simply insisting that Jesus thought of himself as something more than a human agent. But their proposition about what this something more entails, if they have a single thesis, is so vacuous as to be entirely unhelpful. Upon close inspection, their insistence on Jesus' self-understanding as more than human, because it finds no solid ground in the historical data, appears to be driven primarily by the Catholic theological tradition, which claims that Jesus of Nazareth could not have been a mere man. Quite clearly, in the EHCC's rush to answer the siren call of this tradition, they have moved on too quickly from a perfectly sufficient answer to the question of Jesus' self-awareness. Already in their hands lies the stark fact of Jesus' claim to agency, that is, 
that he is a human being acting on God's behalf, a fact both necessary and entirely sufficient for explaining the biblical and historical data. We simply have no need for more than this. The Jesus of the Gospels presumes to do what God does because he believed that God had granted him the right and the ability to do so. Again, this proposition that Jesus is the agent of God is agreed upon by all of these EHCC scholars. And it's actually fascinating that they agree with us, since the uh, Jesus being the agent of God, in other words, someone other than God, is not part of Orthodox Christology. Nevertheless, they must acknowledge this fact since it is so painfully clear. But because it is not Orthodox and because it fits hand in glove with the theory of their Unitarian Christian rivals, they must simply tip their hats and walk briskly past it, moving on to something more Orthodox sounding. Ultimately, it's Hurtado's revelation that gives the game away. The fact that the Jesus of the Gospels does not think he is God, much less the second person of the Trinity, demonstrates that recourses to Trinity and deity were not necessary in the minds of the Gospel writers in order to explain Jesus' historical actions. Thus, the intra-Gospel explanation of Christ's actions, namely that his authority was given to him by another, God, should be emphasized. And I humbly suggest that the only reason good historians will ever feel compelled to pursue any explanation explanation beyond Christ's human agency is if they perceive that this answer falls short of the requirements of orthodox theology or the expectations of an orthodox audience. What this survey of EHCC opinions about Jesus' self-awareness ultimately reminds us of is the fundamental and glaring weakness of the school's hypothesis, its lack of meaning. Precisely what is meant by high Christology? Something functional or metaphysical? Members of the EHCC don't seem to agree on what early high Christology actually entails. For some, it means that from the earliest days of the Christian movement, Jesus was understood to be the second member of the Trinity. For some, it means that he was understood to be divine in some vague sense, or even more vaguely, that he was included in the divine identity of Yahweh. For others, it simply means that Jesus was exalted to God's right hand and worshipped alongside the Father, which is a view compatible with Unitarian Christian theologies. If early high Christology amounts to an imprecise claim about divinity or worship practices, then many sorts of Christians, including Unitarians, could claim membership in this Christological club. And for this reason, the meaning and value of early high Christology in contemporary debate is difficult to discern. If in the end the phrase early high Christology fails to describe any particular Christological proposition, the phrase may show itself to be merely code for an affirmation of the cogency and truthfulness of orthodoxy. But as it stands with no singular and agreed upon thesis in view, the EHCC seems to be a club in search of a thesis. Now, how does the standard Unitarian reading, in which Jesus understood himself to be the human agent of God, full stop, compare? Not only does this basic proposal form the uncontroversial substratum of all of the above EHCC interpretations, it is, as I will now demonstrate, the only historically plausible option. Taking a cue from Wright, we will consider Jesus' own feelings about his career. And taking a cue from Hurtado, we will consider how other people treated Jesus during his ministry. And here it will become clear that not only did Jesus' audience perceive a claim to be God's human agent, it is equally clear that his audience did not perceive an additional claim to be the one God himself in any sense satisfactory to Orthodox theology, giving us little reason to assume that such a claim was made. During his career, Jesus' disciples both perceived and agreed with his messianic claim, as did other Jews, as did the demons. This self-understanding was also recognized by his religious and political enemies. During Jesus' trial in all four Gospels, any suspicions or charges about claims to deity which may have previously emerged had now subsided, and we are left only with the messianic agential claim. The plaque over his cross, among the most historically reliable facts related to Jesus' messianic self-consciousness and its public perception, is in agreement. Indeed, that Jesus was executed for being a messianic pretender is generally agreed upon by all parties to form part of the bedrock data in the gospel tradition. It's also clear that Jesus' messianic aspirations included a claim to be a prophet of Israel's God, and his early supporters in the gospels likewise affirmed this status. Indeed, Jesus is 
con, uh, considered by friendly Jews in the Gospels to be, quote, a man who is a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, Luke 24, 19. And early Christian interpretations of Jesus as a prophet who performed God's works continued at least into the last quadrant of the first century. See Acts uh, 2, 3, and 7. Peter's interaction with Jesus in Matthew 16, 14 through 17 is similarly instructive. Here Jesus asks Peter what the people make of him, and Peter returns with a variety of answers. Some say he's John the Baptist, others say he is Elijah or Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Quite clearly, he is understood to be a human prophet who worked and spoke on their ancestral deity's behalf. However, Peter does add something important. In addition to being a prophet, Jesus was also the long-awaited Messiah, the Son of God, and therefore the Son of David, destined to rule for God in Israel. This constitutes the basic Christian confession. Jesus is not merely a prophet. He is uniquely God's Messiah. It is important to note that in Matthew 16, 14 through 17, not only are the answers God, God incarnate, deity, angel, or any such construal entirely absent from both Peter's survey of public opinion and his own confession. Jesus, uh, excuse me, Peter's answer is the only intra-gospel and Jesus-approved interpretation of his identity. This answer likewise constitutes, as we have already seen, the underlying agreement of all scholars, Trinitarian, Unitarian, or otherwise. And in this light, to affirm Jesus' humanity and his messianic self-awareness and nothing more is only to assume the most textually and historically conservative of positions. The fact that such an interpretation will be seen as anything but theologically conservative by some apologists is irrelevant to the work of history. Against C.S. Lewis' famous and fallacious trilemma, the historical Jesus need not have been a lunatic or a liar or one who conceived of himself in terms of Orthodox Christology at all, but he might have understood himself to be a human being, a Jew and a committed monotheist, a man through whom the God of Israel was redeeming the world. Thus, the range of interpretive choices is appropriately reduced, not arbitrarily against Lewis, but by the constraints of history. And in light of this history, it seems clear that a claim to be the one God would have invalidated Jesus' claims to be God's prophet and Messiah in the eyes of his Jewish audience. The intra-gospel evidence demonstrates that his audience expected that the Messiah would be a human being, the son of David, and a prophet, and one who would do God's works. Indeed, to be a Messiah, by definition, is to not be God but someone anointed by God for the execution of his work. In the same way, the fact that Jesus' self-awareness as a prophet of God was so widely recognized demonstrates that he did not claim to be God. It should go without saying that no God can be their own prophet. That is, that no one can speak on their own behalf. In the Jewish consciousness, it is clear that a prophet is a human being who speaks on God's behalf. Thus, the fact that any Jewish monotheist accepted Jesus as both God's Messiah and as God's prophet is indicative not only of his core identity claims, but implies his failure to publicly express any belief that he was also God. Of course, <clears throat> With the Jewish recognition of his particular messianic claim, there is included an awareness of Jesus' presumption to occupy divine roles. It is evident that some Jews, namely the scribes and the Pharisees, took issue with Jesus' claim to authority. Does their furor at his trial over his claim to be the Son of Man seated in judgment over the earth evidence an additional claim to be something more than God's anointed, something more than God's ultimate human prophet? Some of his enemies evidently believed his claim to divine authority sufficiently invalidated his messianic potential. In their eyes, his presumption of messianic status did not comport with his actions. As John Nolan writes, it is clear that the Jews had a range of beliefs about precisely what might be involved in the messianic program. Thus, the famous accusation of Jesus' enemies in John 10, 33 should be read in light of a Jewish disagreement about the boundaries of messianic authority. The Jews answered him, It is not for a good work that we are to stone you, but for blasphemy, because you, a man, make yourself God. The context of this charge is clearly Jesus' assumption of the Father's works. Jesus has put himself in God's place and has presumed to do something which his enemies believed was reserved for God. 
While it is possible that the messianic category was in the eyes of Jesus, some of Jesus' enemies too restricted to account for these claims, this was not the case for Jesus or his sympathizers, the ones with whom the gospel writers would have us sympathize. Beyond being the Messiah, did Jesus' claims to divine authority imply that he imagined himself to also be more than human? Did he think of himself as additionally a heavenly being like Michael or Gabriel? John Nolan also reports that, quote, though Jesus' authority claim might have made some sense in relation to such a figure, the Jesus of first century Palestine could hardly, even in his own self-deluded fantasy, have been identified in that sort of way, end quote. Rather, he says, quote, the most likely option is that Jesus' extraordinary authority claim is to be connected with his own eccentric brand of messianism, end quote. Of course, even if his Johannine enemies did perceive an additional claim to ontological deity, such confusion had ostensibly subsided by his trial, where no such exhibit is introduced, though such a claim would have immediately made their case. Indeed, if there existed real evidence that Jesus had taught others that he was the God of Israel, there would have been no need for a trial, much less the false witnesses brought against him, and he could have been justifiably executed on the spot. Since Jesus' enemies were constantly looking for ways to invalidate his messianic claims in the eyes of the people, the fact that they were unable to cite any claims to his deity at his trial is evidence that no such claims could reasonably be construed from his assertions. Ultimately, Jesus' supporters in the Gospels and Jesus himself believed in the Messiah's authority to do God's work, and such claims would not have constituted, in their minds, a claim to be God, especially since a cl that claim would run contrary to all of their pre-existing expectations about not only God's nature, for example, that he's not a man, Numbers 23, 19, but about the nature of the Messiah and the very meaning of the terms Messiah and prophet. Ultimately, it is historically implausible that the first Palestinian Jews who composed the earliest Jesus movement would have agreed with Jesus' claim to be both God's Messiah and prophet and also have agreed with an additional claim to be the God of Israel, as, a, as that additional claim would only destroy the first two claims. It seems clear, invoking Michael Golder, that no first century Jew could have sanely thought himself to be Yahweh. I furthermore suggest that no first century Jew could have sanely thought any other man was Yahweh either, especially if that man claimed at the same time to be Yahweh's Messiah and prophet. Evoking C.S. Lewis, such a man would be considered by the people to be a lunatic on a level with the man who says he is a poached egg. Such an imprecise and uncharitable vision continues to pale in comparison to the Jesus of the Gospels, even the Jesus of John's Gospel, who stirs his audience with such focused claims as this. I am a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. Our investigation of EHCC answers to the question, did Jesus know he was God, has not instilled much confidence that the club has quite worked out the problem of Jesus' self-understanding or that it has any one clear proposal for Christology in view. On the other hand, a human Christology is not only able to reconcile Jesus' self-image across all four Gospels, it releases readers from the paradoxical strain of orthodox metaphysics and allows the historical Jesus to live within the text as a completely self-aware person without the threat of incarnational implosion, wherein a consciousness of deity destroys any genuine or meaningful human experience. The unambiguous message of all four Gospels is that Jesus is God's prophet and Messiah, and this inarguable fact should drive our interpretation of Jesus' self-understanding in these documents. As we have observed, EHCC proposals attempt to lead their readers to affirm orthodox theological propositions which go beyond and threaten the interpretive categories of the thought world they presume to illuminate. But upon close inspection, the EHCC proposals about Jesus thinking he was in some sense divine or that he was included in the divine identity actually fail to explain either the Jesus of the Gospels or Orthodox tradition. In truth, this language provides merely a new and unclear set of terms, which in the end constitute both historical and theological failures because we have no idea what they mean, and therefore no idea if they even mean what the Orthodox creeds are thought to have meant, or if they are something new entirely. In other words, we don't even know if the favored statements of the early High Christology Club are in fact Orthodox statements. In the final analysis, this language seems to serve a mostly practical purpose, the building of a protective cocoon around an Orthodox narrative. <laughs> 
However, the orthodox narrative which the EHCC hallows and in which the eternal God comes down and obscures himself in Jesus is in the final analysis not only unnecessary, it eclipses the biblical narrative in which, quote, God has made this Jesus both Lord and Messiah, in quote, Acts 2.36. The Unitarian option which emphasizes Jesus' self-awareness as God's human agent and nothing more appears to be not only the best and most conservative interpret interpretive option for the gospel data, but the only viable answer in, terms of, in light of what we know about Jewish messianic uh, expectations in the first century and Jewish understandings of the term prophet and Messiah in that historical context. Thank you. Thank you.